Morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, first sec uh, session of the Overture and Beginners track. Uh, first up, we have uh, Brendan uh, Megalees, who's going to talk about should I bring my project to the Apache Incubator, and he is the chair of the Incubator PMC. Well, well good morning, everyone. Uh, this talk was born from a hypothesis that some people coming to the ApacheCon might be people who are participants in open source software outside of Apache or participants in some sort of commercial enterprise that produces something that they're thinking of perhaps moving into open source at Apache and might find it informative to learn something about what are the conditions under which it makes sense to bring a project to Apache and what on earth happens to you once you try. So, just to give people a preview in a very brief sense of what this talk is going to discuss, uh, I have a kind of, it, it's not big enough to be a table of contents, so I made it an ottoman of contents. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to spend the first chunk of time talking about what belongs at Apache. Now, in some sense, this produces an odd situation, which is you could answer the same question, perhaps with less snark, by listening to Nick Birch's talk in the other track on community over code or community and code, talking about the Apache way. But here you are, and you'll get it from me with sarcasm. Uh, once I've uh, given some explanation of what sorts of projects make sense and perhaps more importantly don't make sense as projects to bring to the Apache incubator, then I will proceed to talk to give a bit of an overview of what is the incubator, how does it work, what happens to you if you come there. But I want to emphasize even before I start that no one should think they're going to take a test on this. There's a, a copious quantity of documentation about the incubator and of course a mailing list full of people all ready to give you misleading answers to your questions about what's going on. Uh, and so you don't have to feel like you need to learn this from me, but this will give you a flavor. So, should you bring a project to the Apache Incubator? Well, really, if you're asking, should you bring a project to the Apache Incubator, you're asking, should you bring a project to Apache? What are the characteristics of projects that make them likely to be happy and successful as open source projects at Apache? And on the other hand, what are the characteristics of projects which would make them relatively unlikely, or in fact, likely to be unhappy or unsuccessful? So let's start with the negative, of course, OK. So I titled this talk, Should I Bring My Project to the Apache Incubator? That was a trap, okay? That's a trick. That was there to fool you. Uh, if you are the proud owner of a piece of open source that you have been lovingly and carefully curating and controlling every bit twiddle and, you know, and, and um, supervising every capitalization of every comment, you probably need to think long and hard or perhaps consider medication before you try to bring that project to Apache. Because if it, one of the particular specimens that Apache is very interested in avoiding is a species called the benevolent dictator for life. Now, you can go on YouTube and you can find a number of talks about people talking about styles of open source projects. And as a kind of recurring theme here, I'm not here to tell you that benevolent dictator for life projects are evil but they sure don't belong at Apache. An Apache project is, contrary-wise, a project that is a community. It's not just a code base with one or even a small self-selected group of people acting as gatekeepers and sentinels and, you know, and, and very carefully selecting who and what comes in and out. It's a large enough group, it's, it's an open group of people, it adds people all the time, it loses people from time to time. Those people somehow or another learn to rub along wherever they are and whatever their particular personalities or organizational affiliations are to make collective decisions more or less by consensus about what's going to happen. What code changes are acceptable, what code changes are not acceptable. Who's going to join the community? Are we going to capitalize all the variable names? Whatever it is, it's a community decision. It is not the fiat of some one person or small group of people in charge. Now, this means that for your project to succeed, it will eventually have to grow to have a viable community. There's a kind of minimum definition, absolute rock bottom minimum definition of viable, which is three. Really, that's just eking along. You, that has to do with voting procedure. You can't have less than three. You're looking to build a, a community of people 
oh, you know, roughly speaking, you're a happy project if you're starting out with about a dozen, you know, within your first year or so. And that means finding these people. So if you're one person or two people or three people and you have some code and you bring it to Apache and it's a great idea, that's wonderful, but you won't be a successful Apache project unless you manage to, you know, act as a sticky object and pull in some number of additional participants. They don't all have to be the chief hackers of the Western world. Many projects have many important contributors who organize things, write documentation, keep track of business, but there has to be a big enough community or your project won't be a successful Apache project. And the other thing to note, which sort of relates to some things in the keynote speech we just heard is that keeping all these people happy and successful in the community is going to involve making allowances for the fact that they're spread in many different places, that they're in many different time zones, that they have different ways of thinking about things, and that you won't always move as fast as you think you could move if there were three of you drinking a lot of coffee in Starbucks for an afternoon. Now, what's another bad idea for a sort of an attitude to bring to an Apache project? Well, the second, you know, the second relatively unhelpful idea that I wanted to highlight about bringing projects to Apache is the sentiment in quotes in red on this slide. Now, interestingly enough, when I sent these slides out for, rev for review, someone who was reviewing them for me, uh, his first reaction was, what do you mean corporations are evil? Corporations are fine at Apache. Well, in fact, that's the point of this, okay? Now, there, there are open source communities that have goals and even build whole licenses around these goals, which are relatively incompatible with corporate involvement. Now, different people will express different opinions about whether particular licenses are more or less compatible with corporate involvement, but at the end of the day, Apache is particularly and acutely friendly to corporate involvement. So if you have qualms and squeamishness about corporations, if the idea that someone might make some money by incorporating your code into something they do gives you the heebie-jeebies or sends you off to, you know, to, in, in, to, put, to put up a big sign that says no, then please don't waste your time bringing, that project to, bringing your project to Apache. You'll only be miserable because it, it's a principle of things at Apache that, and I'll explain more about the details in a moment, that corporations are really just fine with us. Now, how are corporations fine with us? There are kind of two sides of this coin. We say corporation, corporate involvement, making money is not an evil thing at Apache, but on the other hand, Apache projects are not the puppets of corporate influence. So Apache is also not a place to bring your project if what you are doing is running a company and you think it would be great marketing buzz if your project had the Apache feather all over it and you could say, oh yes, we're Apache X. But meanwhile, you're very carefully making sure that the project consists only of what you need and only of what you want and nothing that could possibly benefit your competitors. And you're going to work very hard to make sure that your competitors are kept at a safe distance. No, we're not doing that here, okay? At Apache, while corporations use Apache products, corporations very frequently pay people to work on Apache projects. Corporations do not control Apache projects. All of us who work at Apache on the code projects, as Jim said in the first talk today, are operating as individual volunteers. Now, let me stop for a second on that. I have to confess that the first time I heard this, my head almost exploded from cognitive dissonance. How can it be simultaneously true that a person is a free will volunteer contributing code just for the fun of it to an Apache project while they're being paid for it? Somehow or another, this seemed to go right up there with uh, we believe it because it is absurd, or whatever that famous Latin saying is from uh, Christian theology. Well, at Apache, we have this concept called hats, and I wish I had a funny slide for this, but I don't. But we expect people to understand what role they're playing on any given day. If you're operating within an Apache project, if you're making a code contribution, critiquing someone else's, doing whatever you're doing, we expect you to be wearing your hat of your role as an individual Apache contributor doing your best for the project and the larger community to, for the mission of Apache. Your corporate hat is a very nice hat. It probably pays your rent, but you're not wearing it while you're doing those things. Now, I've sort of, as typical, gotten a little bit ahead of my slides. So, you know, this, this is a short list of things you don't do as part of corporate involvement at Apache. We don't have projects that are fronts for corporations. Another thing we do is defend trademarks, and this will be an issue if you've got code and you're associated with a corporate environment and you want to bring that code to Apache. So Apache 
came to the conclusion, the foundation came to the conclusion a few years ago that trademarks really were important. That if, it were, if there was Apache Tomcat, it was really a bad thing if people were running websites that said Tomcat all over them that were really selling malware that happened to incorporate Apache, uh, Apache Tomcat or entirely selling services for Apache Tomcat and not acknowledging the involvement of the foundation that the, the trademarks were important. So the foundation goes to a lot of trouble or to be exact, the foundation makes its participants go to a lot of trouble to hold and defend trademarks. So if you've got some lovely body of code that you as a corporate entity want to bring to Apache, one thing you have to be prepared to do when you bring it to Apache is to bring the trademarks with it or rename it either way, but you can't have an Apache project operating under a name that can't be trademarked. You can't have an Apache project operating under a name that's a trademark held by someone else. The, pro the trademarks have to travel with the code. And really, as I said before, the projects are operating as neutral turf. Now, I would be lying to you if I told you that everything was sweetness and light and ponies and unicorns every day. There, uh, the, the downside, one of the interesting stresses, should I say, of success as seen at Apache projects is that once a lot of people have their livelihood depending on what's going on in an Apache project, strangely, they develop very strong opinions about what happens next. Um, and those opinions can lead to some pretty sticky moments in the communities where people have to sort out what's going to happen, who's going to be the next PMC chair, which way is the code going to go, when are we going to have a release, what's going to be in it. And all those, the, the hardest job almost next to actually building a community in the first place is keeping a community happy, relatively speaking, and successful and functional in spite of the stresses that success brings. So the other side of this coin, the good side of the coin is, if you're a corporation, you can bring, a cor you can bring code to Apache. You can encourage your people to work, to participate and contribute to Apache projects. You can pay them to do that. Um, and all in all, as a corporation, you can play nice. You know, nothing is more boring than reading the trademark mailing list at Apache and finding yourself faced with email from somebody from one company complaining bitterly that somebody from another company has sent an email message that, you know, they think violates the trademark of an Apache. You know, all this stuff, I would use a different four-letter, I'd use a four-letter word if I wasn't trying to be nice, okay? You know, uh, no one's, we're, we're all in this together. We're sort of neutral turf. A good attitude to bring to Apache in some ways is like the attitude that's occasionally been manifested at standards organizations where somehow or another everybody managed to check their tomatoes at the door and get on with it. Now, another way of introducing uh, sort of what makes a suitable project for Apache is to talk a little bit from a kind of a particular sarcastic tone of view, t point of view about the infrastructure at Apache. So Jim said, you know, isn't it great, Jim, Jagle J Jim Jagelski, the president who gave the, the introductory talk today, I keep forgetting that this thing will probably turn up on YouTube and people will be watching it who have no idea what happened 15 minutes ago. Uh, he talked about how we have this all, the, we have these infrastructure contractors, we have all this infrastructure, it serves the projects. Well, he also told you that relatively speaking, the Apache Foundation is lean. It runs on a surprisingly small budget for what it does. It tries to make those dollars go a long way. And one of the ways it, do it does that is by being something of the Ford Motor Company of project infrastructure. Uh, for those of you who aren't quite as old as I am, perhaps the expression, you can have any color you like as long as it's black, uh, may or may not ring any bells. Now, uh, it's not really quite as bad as that, but and, uh, but it is true that if you, if you have a really ferocious attachment to some fundamental piece of infrastructure, like say, particularly a source control system, which is not currently part of the Apache infrastructure, then you're not going to get a happy answer when you come and bring your code to the incubator. You're not going to suddenly discover that people are going to lay down in front of you and say, yes, indeed, we'll have that um, mercurial infrastructure set up for you in a week, no problem. And even many smaller things than an entire copy of Mercurial are not going to materialize just because you ask for them. Now, the other side of the coin from this, the positive side of the coin, is there is, in fact, a fair amount of infrastructure present at the foundation which is there for you to use. Uh, as far as version control systems are, you have your choice of subversion or Git. Uh, 
as far as bug tracking is going, we've got a JIRA instance and a Bugzilla instance. As far as uh, somebody asked me to mention Review Board, a commonly used device for helping people do code reviews. And there's a wide variety of other smaller bits and pieces available. And if you have some particular item that is not too horribly challenging or for which you have a really good reason, yes, you can bring it to the infrastructure team and you can make your case and you might even, it, it, there's a, you might very likely get it stood up, but you will not get it stood up in five minutes flat, and you will not get it stood up sort of just because you say so. And one particular thing to warn you about is you won't get it stood up by saying, oh, but I'll do all the work. The foundation's infrastructure is considered a security issue. Uh, if the foundation's infrastructure is compromised, bad things happen. At the, and at the extreme, it results in serious problems for people's confidence in the Apache products. And so the infrastructure contractors are, for good reason, very, very averse to handing out uh, karma, as it were, to administrative access privileges to systems at Apache. So you can't really just sort of waltz in and say, no problem, I need this, it doesn't need much hardware footprint, I'll take care of it, just hand me the keys to a server and I'll take care of it. And really, save yourself some stress if you come to Apache, seek out advice before trying that trick, okay? It's, it isn't going to be as simple as that. Now, so that's the end of my first sort of large section, which was what kind of projects come to Apache. And while I didn't leave myself an interstitial slide, I'll talk a little bit about what that all summarizes. So it, Apache projects are community groups. They have to be a medium-sized handful of people to have any chance of function. They are intended to be potentially geographically, organizationally, culturally, and I don't know, attitudinally diverse in spite of whatever Java monocultural tendencies we've been diagnosed with in the previous talk. And they operate within the Apache infrastructure and they you know, are friendly to corporate involvement, friendly to corporate contributions without being particularly friendly to overbearing corporate overbearingness. So having said that, what's an incubator anyway? I mean, we all know what an incubator is. It's a thing for hatching eggs. What on earth does this have to do with the problem? Well. The incubator came into existence at Apache to solve a, a, a bootstrapping problem. Of course, we're computer people, we think in those terms, right? Where, mommy, mommy, where do new Apache projects come from, right? Where are we going to get one from? So I wasn't here for this, but extensive rumors suggest to me and the occasional mailing list quotation from long ago that when the Apache Foundation, when the Apache group first contemplated the possibility that some other people might show up and look at what they were doing with the original HTTP daemon and say, we think we could do something like this. Maybe we could do something like this in Java. Maybe we could do something like this that solves a slightly different problem. That they, they set some people up and they turned them loose and honestly, once or twice, something completely horrible happened, okay? There was a horrible meltdown in which they discovered that community values do not arise by being picked out of trees. Community values are something people have to learn. Not everybody has an idea in their head to begin with of how to operate as a community, how to operate by consensus, how to avoid some of the pitfalls I was talking about a moment ago. So some years ago, quite a while ago now, the foundation launched the concept of an incubator as a bootstrapping device for helping projects get off the ground. So, one way I wanted to present the process was by presenting it in reverse. And the reason I wanted to present it in reverse was to really emphasize the goal of the process. You bring a project to the Apache Incubator to become a top-level project of the Apache Software Foundation. There's some other outcomes that could happen I'll talk about eventually, but that's what we're aiming for. The whole incubator exists only as a way to, get, to help groups of people to get themselves into a situation where they can function as a top-level project reporting to the board. Everything else is just mechanism. It's a means to an end. It has no value except to the, effect, to the effect that it supports that process. So the end process, therefore, is being a top-level project. How do you get to be a top-level project? You get to be a top-level project if the board votes to establish you as a top-level project. That's the legal structure. When does the board vote to establish top-level projects? Well, 99, well, I don't know, we don't have had enough projects to say 99 times out of 100, but in, in current practice, essentially the only way that a top-level project is established is if the incubator PMC votes to recommend to the foundation board that they should establish a project. So 
There's a vote of, the, of a thing called the incubator, of the incubator Project Committee. I'll tell you what that is in a minute. Okay, when does that happen? That happens when the project demonstrates that it's been operating in a way that could be mistaken in a dark alley for an Apache project, okay? That means it has a community, it can build a community, and it can build code. So you might think that those two are obvious, but as I'll discuss in a couple of slides, maybe not. Um, okay, how do you get to the point of demonstrating you can operate? Well, you have to set up shop. Simple enough. And when, what gives you the permission to set up shop? Well, another vote of the incubator says, yes, we've seen a proposal. We like this group. We think this group of people can, is, 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 set, is ready to start. We'll let them have the infrastructure at Apache to have a, 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 what's called a podling, a project supervised by the incubator. And when does that happen? When you write a proposal. So now, reversing the order, let's start with a proposal. What's the proposal? Well, the proposal is a document built from a template that says, what do you want to do? What's your mission going to be? Every Apache project has to have some moderately concrete mission. A projects occasionally grow and change and mutate and even sometimes split and merge. But you can't just say, write software for the benefit of the public. The foundation already owns that one. You have to be a little more specific. Um, <laughs> you have to pick a specific mission, like create a web services suite conforming to, very, to certain well-understood standards that's written in Java. Um, that might be a mission statement, more or less. Now, then what are your initial conditions? Have you already got code? Very frequently, incubator projects start because there's an existing body of code somewhere. It's inside a company, it's sitting on GitHub, it's, uh, it's on SourceForge that you're gonna bring. Who are gonna be the initial uh, participants? Generally, the initial participants are people who have had some involvement with the code to begin with, if there is code. Though occasionally, when code's being contributed by a company, we'll see sort of a suspiciously long list of people who are employees of that company, and we don't really ask a lot of questions about their provenance, because their long-term uh, membership in the community will depend on their contributions to the community. And who are going to be your mentors? I'll talk about mentors some more in a bit, but mentors are existing members of the Apache Foundation, or at least of the Apache program uh, the incubator who are there to supervise what you're doing coach what you're doing make sure that the right things are happening um, and the because of the whole question of companies seeing Apache as an attractive target for brand building the uh, proposal template has a bunch of specific questions in it about corporate involvement from the particular point of view of making sure that we're sort of filtering out people who are just sort of transparently trying to build Potemkin villages at the foundation. Now, under this section, I thought it was worth making a brief summary of who are all these people I've been talking about anyway. Um, at the top of the governance tree is the board. That's nine people elected by the members of the foundation. I suppose, oh, well, I should have put it the very, uh, even above the board of the members themselves, but this is not really the talk for that. The Incubator Project Management Committee is a committee of volunteers. Who's on the committee? Well, the rules of the foundation are that any member of the foundation can be a member of the committee, and then the committee sometimes elects other people who aren't members of the foundation who want to participate in its activities. Members of the IPMC, like members of every other PMC at the Apache Foundation, have binding votes on things like releases or commits to the code base, uh, which they, you, in the IPMC, get used a lot for releases and hardly ever for votes on the code. Who, are the, who else have we got here? Well, I'm gonna skip the shepherds and come back to them in a moment. Who are the mentors? Well, we can't just, you know, somebody's gotta be paying attention around here and somebody's gotta tell you what to do. If you're coming to the foundation, yeah, we have a bunch of things written down, but it's never quite enough. Someone has to mediate between the people wandering in from the street and the foundation's existing policies and structures and help them to figure out, how do we do this? How do we hold a vote on a release? How do we put the right headers in our source files? What is the stuff that has to be on, you know, what has to be in a release anyway? Those are your mentors. Of course, your mentors are also accepting some responsibility for keeping track of what you're doing. After all, at the end of the day, the PMC is responsible for a number of things. It's responsible for the fact that the code that gets checked into the source control system really is licensed to the foundation. It's responsible for the fact that the project is playing nice and having good community values. If we already trusted you all to do all that perfectly, we wouldn't be a podling, you'd just be a project. So your mentors are the, pe are the people who are particularly responsible for paying attention. Okay, so now for a little dirty laundry. There are a lot of podlings, 
and a certain number of mentors. And it's not always true that we have enough mentor attention on the projects on any given day inside the incubator. That's just a fact about life at Apache. And so what the project, what the committee has come up with is a way of mitigating that difficulty a little bit is a group of people called the shepherds. So the shepherds are people who aren't specifically mentors of individual projects necessarily, but who devote time and energy to looking in on individual podlings from time to time, seeing how they're doing, looking over their mailing lists, looking at their releases, um, just giving a bit of a checkup to help the PMC as a whole understand what's the state of health of the podling. So those are the shepherds. Um, towards the bottom of the page are the PPMC and the, the, what I well labeled PPMC and committers, which is to say the people who actually are in the podling, the people doing the work. Now I put them in the same color for a reason. So in a full blown running up and going Apache project, there's a PMC. These are people who have been elected by their peers and accepted by the board. Mind you, that's pretty much a rubber stamp formality, and who have actual responsibility for supervision of what goes in source control and what comes out as releases. And then they're committers. Committers are a much potentially larger group of people who are given permission to modify what's in the source control system. So this, the committers are just given permission to go ahead and commit stuff. That's how work gets done. But the PMC are the people who actually are responsible for worrying about what's in there. Now, when a podling starts out, they're almost always exactly the same people. In fact, to tell you the truth, there are a number of full-blown operating top-level projects at Apache in which they're all the same people anyway. Many, some projects at Apache just decide as a matter of policy that anyone they trust enough to give them access to commit to the source code, they're also going to give them authority as part of the committee. Other projects maintain this as a two-phase a two process where you get commit access by showing some engagement with the community and you get PMC access if you hang around and participate in some larger ways. So, over time, some podlings choose to begin to stratify in that fashion. Frankly, most don't. Most podlings just maintain a, pro a PPMC, which is all the committers, and they worry about who's the PMC when it's time to graduate. Now, when we have a proposal, the next step in the process is there's a vote on that proposal. So, big secret, it's hard to lose one of these votes. I mean, honestly, the real reason it's hard to lose one, to loop for one of these votes to fail is that what tends to happen is that proposals don't make it to a vote that don't have the necessary wherewithal to be successful. If you put up a proposal and it just does not seem like you have enough people or enough code or you have some of those other problems I was talking about before, a polite but firm conversation will ensue on the mailing list and that will kind of be the end of that. In my time around the incubator, I have never actually seen one of these proposals be brought to a vote, and then, oh dear. <laughs> and then fail. Um, I don't really, okay. This is gonna make a great video. <laughs> and I thought I turned all the necessary crap off. Um, so, a very important question about having a proposal that succeeds is to actually stir up some mentors. Now, if you're a lucky set of ducklings who are proposing to be a podling, you already have connections at Apache. Your mentors are people you know. But more likely, you've put up a proposal. You've sent mail to the mailing list, and you said, would anyone please mentor us? And your ability to attract mentors will honestly depend on um, your winsome ways and whether your technology or subject matter attracts the attention of people. If you beg hard enough, though, you can usually come up with some mentors. Now. So, you made a proposal, the, PM, the IPMC voted, you're in business, now what? Okay, a whole bunch of infrastructure happens. Um, though that's not the order in which I put this on the slide, silly me. Okay, well, so, in order to get any code into Apache, really, why do we have a foundation? What is the purpose of having a foundation as opposed to, I don't know, a giant secret conspiracy or something? The foundation is all about, about intellectual property management. The code that comes into the foundation is licensed to the foundation. The foundation licenses it out to other people. And as a result, that limits the liability of the people who work as volunteers in the foundation to certain kinds of potential legal imbrogliados that could arise. I am not qualified to talk about the details of that. But how does the code get to be, get to be licensed to the foundation? There are basically two ways. Either a big lump of code is coming in all at once, in which case it's granted to the foundation by an individual or corporation 
or individuals are making contributions one commit or patch at a time. Individuals who are doing that have to file with the foundation a thing called an individual contributor license agreement, which says that which which basically legally documents their willingness to contribute the code to the foundation. So, because, so that's one of the very first bootstrapping steps. It's often the slowest one, is for all the initial people on the, on, the, on the committee in the podling to say, here's my form. You fax it into the foundation or you mail a, a scanned image to the right e email address and things happen. Um, I already told you what a PPMC is. So once you, have, once you have some accounts, which you get as a result of filing your ICLA, you can set up source control, mailing lists, bug tracking, builds, all that stuff, okay? You do this, in fact, by opening tickets, in, in many cases, by opening tickets in the foundation's JIRA bug tracking instance to ask the infrastructure team politely to do things for you, and these things all happen in a couple of days. Now, to finish up on what I started with, in most cases that I have seen, podlings come to the foundation with a non-trivial body of existing code, okay? That needs a little more legal handling than just one person submitting one patch on one day. And for this, we have the C CCLAs and SGAs. What a lot of alphabet soup. A corporate contributor license agreement is what goes into place to allow, in fact, I think I have a slide with more details on this. Yeah. So, Individuals make contributions, individuals license their contributions, you give us a form that says who you are, by the way, are you trying to keep yourself a secret? Well, not quite, okay? The, eventually that document is really a matter of public record, though the foundation will indulge people in having user IDs that don't reveal their names sort of gratuitously all over the place. Uh, once you file this, you get an account. Now, what if you're part of a corporation? After all, that's quite likely. Well, if you're working for hire, then your company, the company you work for probably has some rights to your work. So your company also has to be willing to pitch that work into Apache for you to contribute it. That's a CCLA. So if you're just all by yourself working in your spare time, all you need is an ICLA. If, you're, if your work is work for hire, you need a CCLA. If in addition to that, there's some giant ball of code that already exists that you're bringing into the foundation, and how big is giant? I can't tell you. We make up that answer that question every time when it comes up. Um, then there's a separate piece of legal documentation called a software grant agreement, which is used to clarify the legal status of some existing code coming in. Now, okay, yeah, the last bullet's important too. Uh, this comes up from time to time. Can your legal department ask for modifications to these agreements? No. Uh, I've seen them turned down over and over again. So uh, the foundation can't afford enough lawyers to get involved in negotiations on this. So if you can't learn to live with those agreements, by and large, you're out of luck. Now, as you're setting up, you have to answer a few policy questions for your project. Are you going to commit then review or review then commit? Or have an, you know, I, 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 I don't know, a weekly Sabbath at the full moon in which you make decisions about code. Most projects at the foundation are simply commit, then review, or review, then commit. Foundation doesn't care. Pick one, document it, stick to it. Uh, who's going to commit? Okay, I confess, there's been a long controversial discussion about this around the foundation lately, and I'm going to summarize it as follows. Uh, the source control systems at Apache will allow you to say who's got access to commit to your project. And you have to make some decisions. Do you want to say, well, we're very careful about who actually has physical permission to commit to this project? Or do you want to say, ah, oh, a fairly broad group of people, in some cases as broad as the entire foundation, have physical permission to commit, but of course we have these policies, and anybody who violates these policies will be spoken to sharply, and maybe will then take away their access. That's, again, your decision to make. You have to decide how much structure to have. As I said a few minutes ago, You've got to decide whether you're going to bother to distinguish between committee members who have responsibility in binding votes and committers who just have rights to commit to the code base. There are a lot of people who believe strongly that those two categories could be the same, but not everybody. The most important thing, however, the most important aspect of this is don't build a moat. And I'll explain that in a second. So now you're up and running. What happens? Okay. Well, you got to get code, right? There's no project without code. Community, uh, community is nice, but it, it's here to make releases, okay? That means you have to have people. That means that somehow or another, your project has to be attractive to people to come and contribute to it. People have to use it. People have to be interested in it. This can be a hard bootstrapping problem. Not everyone succeeds. You make releases. Releases are a whole story. And your mentors help you. 
Now, where do the contributions come from? People who have commit access commit. People who are PMC members, they watch the process, they watch content, and in very extreme cases, you know, I mentioned an idea of voting on code. Now again, I'm not trying to do the whole foundation's operational policy here in this talk, but every once in a long while there really is an argument about some code. And PMC members have the right to say, no, you can't commit that. That might be because they think it's a really bad idea technically. They might be because they think there are legal problems with it. It comes up very infrequently, but it comes up. That's what P PMC members have those votes. Committers don't, okay? PMC members have to vote to release things. Other people supply patches. Now, an interesting thing about the Apache licenses, and one of your best recruiting techniques, is the Apache license says, as part of using the code under the license, you agree that if you give us a patch, we can keep it, unless you say something very specific to avoid that. So anytime somebody sends you a patch, that's code that can just be committed to the code base. More importantly, that's a person you can try to suck in. Again, don't build a moat. Your job is to pull them in. And in particular, uh, the biggest problem that podlings have is growing. If you, now, I was discouraged from writing up here, grow or retire, but you've got to get people into the podling. That's what's going to make the podling a success. And that's not always easy. And so you're, again, I'm just sort of repeating myself, your biggest challenge is to figure out how to attract people and get them to contribute and join the show. Now, we wouldn't be here if we weren't making releases. So we're making releases. We're making releases of source code. We're making releases of source code which fit under the Apache legal umbrella. This means that there are a whole bunch of niggly details that have to be right before a release is allowed to be a release. And there are a few dedicated volunteers on the IPMC who make it their business to make sure that your release conforms to those niggling details in glorious and perfect detail, even sometimes a little more than is absolutely required. And so what you should expect when you're being incubated and you go to make a release is the first time you put up a release for a vote, try though you may, someone named SEBB by email address is going to show up and give you a list of four or five things you got wrong that you'll have to fix. That's just how it works. And that's just life in the big city. That's, how, that's what we're up to here. Decision making. Apache communities are open communities. They make decisions in public. They make decisions on mailing lists. Why do they make decisions on mailing lists in the modern world of Google Hangouts and IRC and all this real-time stuff? Because that person who's 10 time zones away from you cannot reasonably be expected to be there and participate in the process with you from 10 time zones away. So yep, that slows you down. And yeah, you can get together in a hangout or at a bar or something and talk something and work it out, but the formal decision has to be made on the mailing list. Now, now we're reaching the end of the story. At the end, so, so in order to get, we're, we're trying to get rid of you, okay? The IPMC is drowning in things to do. It needs to get rid of podlings, okay? Our biggest problem as a PMC is to help podlings get their act together and get out of there one way or the other so we, so we can mentor the next group of people. So you don't have to have a mature software product. You do have to have a mature community. There's a big spreadsheet, essentially, a kind of a form, you know, it's not really a spreadsheet, but it shows up as a big diagram with a lot of columns on a pay, call, called, called the clutch, another one of these egg jokes, okay? And when all of your boxes are green, we want to get rid of you. Now, so we'd like you to have, by the way, have seen you add a few people to your community as part of this process, but not always entirely practical. There are even exceptions made to that. If you have a critical mass of people and you've been seen to have good relations with people who come and bring you patches and whatnot, you may still graduate. So when you or your mentors or some shepherd busybody decides it's time for you to graduate, a resolution is drafted, some piece of you know, boilerplate legalese for the board that says, hey, you're a project. That gets put up for a discussion in your community. You vote on it if, we, if, if it passes with you. It goes and gets voted at the general incubator list. And if it passes, you go on the agenda for the next board meeting. What about the footnote? Oh, well, of course. Yeah, the board, all, I've never seen the board fail to accept one of these resolutions myself. So the next step is generally beer. Now, but I would be remiss if I didn't say a couple words about what happens if this doesn't work, okay? Not every idea is a viable community. What's going to happen to you? Well, your code is, assuming your code passed IP clearance, 
The code is always there available under the Apache license. Now maybe you can find a home with an existing TLP. This happens sometimes. It may be that your code really just makes sense as just part of the eco ecosystem of some existing project and some negotiation takes place and you join the show. Um, maybe not. What's your worst case scenario? Your worst case scenario is that your project is retired. The code gets put into read-only source control space and it's available for everyone. You can take it off somewhere else and you're done. And I'm done. So, questions? <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs>